right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 International E-Conference on Interreligious Dialogue. My name is Dr. Darren Slade, and I am the president of the Global Center for Religious Research, which is hosting this year's academic conference. Now, one of the great things about GCRR is that you can attend these academic conferences right from the comfort and safety of your own home without having to worry about hotel fees and travel costs, none of that. In fact, you're being joined by students, scholars, and specialists from all over the world right now. And because each of these presentations are video recorded, the information presented here will be available all across the globe for millions of people to see. Now, for those attending live, as you listen to each of the presentations, uh, feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask questions, and our speaker will do their best to answer them at the end of the presentation. With that said, I'd like to introduce to you my very good friend and our next presenter, Dr. Andrew Hung, and allow me to share my screen to give a proper introduction. So Dr. Hung today is going to be discussing Charles Taylor and Paul Tillich on interreligious dialogue. Dr. Hung is a lecturer in college, professional and continuing education at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. He teaches critical thinking, political philosophy, and Chinese culture at the Division of Social Sciences, Humanity, and Design. His research focuses on, not surprisingly, Charles Taylor, Christian ethics, Western, and Chinese philosophy. His recent publications include things like In Defense of Moral Positive Freedom from the China Graduate School of Theolo Theology Journal, uh, Habermas and Taylor on Religious Reasoning in a Liberal Democracy, which is in the European Legacy, a uh, book called The European Legacy Toward New Paradigms, and Mencius in Berlin on Freedom, in, which in, in a new book called Philosophy East and West, which is a forthcoming publication. And with that said, I'll introduce you, or I'll hand it over to my good friend, Dr. Hung. Thank you so much for doing this presentation today. You have the floor, sir. Hey, thank you, Darren. Uh, okay, this is my PowerPoint. Uh, so today, uh, my presentation will focus on uh, mainly methodology, not so much on the content about uh, the in the interreligious dialogue. Uh, so it would be a philosophy, uh, a presentation about a philosophy methodology. Uh, actually, last time I just present, uh, I have a presentation in GCRR uh, about Charles Taylor's uh, view on a uh, sacred age, and then this one I just. You can see it's just uh, following the last presentation, uh, still about uh, Charles Taylor, but in comparison with uh, Paul Tillich. Uh, Charles Taylor is a political philosopher, and he has a famous book uh, published around uh, 10 years ago. It's a sacred age. Uh, in this book, he argues that one of the distinctive features of the Western secularization is the replacement of the will will of transcendent supernatural order by the framework of imminent order. Uh, this new perspective of social reality has objectified social reality as something governed by its own laws. Under the influence of mainstream secularization theory, many people think that the imminent frame must be close to the transcendent. However, Taylor argues that the imminent frame allows the both open and closed spin. It means that uh, it's possible uh, for for us to be open to the transcendent or close. I mean, it's in a secular in a secular world. We it's not necessary for us to reject the transcendent. It's it's open, uh, and it can be closed certainly. For for instance, there's uh, some atheists uh, in this world, and they reject this uh, idea of transcendence or whatever. And we will uh, further discuss further discuss this about, about this uh, later. Taylor points out that people living within the imminent frame is indeed endlessly experiencing cross pressure between the open and closed perspective. Uh, the very success of natural science and the emphasis of mutual benefit by modern moral order inspired by Gautius and Locke have supported the rise of materialism. However, materialism draws three kinds of uh, criticism in the past. Uh, first uh, is this criticism of determinism. Um, uh, even if in psychologists, I know uh, many people believe in uh, determinism and they just think uh, free will is an illusion. 
and uh, I, I think this is really uh, controversial and in particular uh, from a religious perspective. Uh, but, and the second criticism is about a spiritual objection that materialism has neglected our higher ethical spiritual motives. Mm. For instance, uh, uh, in psychology, the behaviorism would, would not consider all this spiritual or ethical dimension. They would just think uh, all our action are just uh, even psychology, psychological action is just uh, a behavior. It's just uh, expressed in in behavior. They don't consider. They don't consider about uh, the nature of. They don't even believe there's a kind of a consciousness or whatever. And there's also a static objection that for them, uh, they would consider. They would just say that aesthetic response should not be just considered as a, another form of pleasurable reaction. They have a deeper, min deeper meaning. Nevertheless, uh, Taylor points out that many of those who share the negation of materialism also want to define themselves against orthodox religion. For instance, Kant, we know uh, he, he believes in God. Huh? You can say uh, Kant, Kant's philosophy is searching a middle way on the one hand, he tried to endorse a theistic position. On the other hand, his position is departing from orthodox uh, Christianity. So you can say, uh, um, can't know the problem of uh, materialism, but he also seems to reject to endorse the uh, orthodox religion. Probably, uh, he also see some, something he cannot accept in the orthodox Christianity. And some scholars find other bases for ethics, such as uh, starting from intuition that we have about human dignity. So all these attempts, even though they reject uh, materialism, but they, they would not consider uh, uh, revelation or traditional uh, orthodox teaching as kind of a foundation of ethics. They will try to find the other foundation as their uh, as their, uh, for their ethics. Taylor states that there are three fields of cross pressure or polarization in modern society. There are conflicts between orthodox religion and materialist atheism, conflicts between utilitarianism and Kantian ethics, and conflicts between discipline, modern moral order, and Nietzschean revolt. And Taylor summarized these debates as a free corner debates. These debates between um, theism, secular humanism, and new new Nietzscheans, uh, new Nietzscheans. According to Taylor, these debates and criticism show that each side raises problems of dilemmas about fullness for the others. Thus, Taylor uses the notion of fullness as a common ground for dialogue between different beliefs and traditions and religious on religious. For example, while the Chilean criticized human, humanian as missing out on something higher in our life, humanian argues that the sense of higher might consist of a self dramatization of heroism. Which, which covers our over and inability to find satisfaction in the ordinary human pressures and fulfillment. And while Christian af Christians affirm the significance of both the sense of higher and ordinary human fulfillment, the Chilean criticized the motivation of Christian position as impure. It's of fear, envy, and resentment. Taylor did not specify his methodology in his A Sacred Age. Actually, here's a chapter to discuss about idealism. Mm, he just defends he's not idealist. <laughs> uh, and it's quite obvious that uh, his defense is based on the criticism of his previous work. And, and in, in this book, A Sacred Age, uh, 
he his 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 historical exploration of Western moral religious debates seems to show that his approach is just uh, like his more genealogy. It's just kind of continuity with his uh, previous method. Uh, his more genealogy present in his source of source of source of the self. In in the source of self, he's he's also given a historical account of a. Uh, of the development and the debate uh, of Western moral religion, Western moral religious uh, view. In sources, Taylor argues that in the face of uh, these constricting moral views, there's a great need for undistorted articulacy about the vision of the good that actually underlie our moral reactions, affinities, and aspirations. To articulate moral intuition is to move from certain moral commandments, external action description to the language of what Clifford Goods call thick description. And for Taylor, there's a uh, different uh, different points for for moral articulations. Actually, uh, I I in my paper I tried to summarize seven, but I just uh, list five. Uh, five uh, point for moral articulation. Uh, articulation for Taylor can deepen our understanding of moral values and reactions by showing what underpins them. And articulation also help us to be aware of the complexity of moral life and the diverse range of goods. Through adding a, depth pers a, a deep perspective of uh, history, one can bring up what is still implicitly working in contemporary life. And fourth, understanding the underpinning of moral responses in a fuller and clear way can make it easier to debate rationally about morality. And fifth, uh, articulation is necessary condition to assess the moral source of those goods. Uh, I would say that the first and the fifth is the most significant reason for Taylor uh, to stress the, 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 the significance of uh, moral articulation. Since in the source of self, he always criticized Many modern theories are, are a kind of uh, ethics of inaccuracy. They don't know. Uh, they don't know what's underlying. What's underlying of the their moral view? Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, he stressed very much on on the kind of uh, historical retrieval of moral moral um, of morality of moral goods. Mm -hmm. He just thinks that uh, contemporary ethics has covered many uh, important moral sources of traditional uh, religious moral will. And Taylor, Taylor believes that by, by articulation, we can get in touch with these moral sources and these moral sources can empower us to behave morally. As we said before, uh, in Taylor's historical account, uh, it always involved different controversies between different moral views. And the point is, uh, the, the question is how, how, how we can arbitrate between these different moral views. And Taylor suggests that we can arbitrate these controversies uh, by using the best account principle. Taylor suggests, suggests uh, three criteria for the best account principle, the transition from one account to another is considered as gain. If first one can make better sense of inner difficulties than the in interlocutor can. And second, one present one presents a development which cannot be explained on the interlocutor's own term. And third, it can be described as a mediate by an error reducing move. Actually, I think Taylor has uh, taken reference to uh, Thomas Kuhn's uh, the scientific revolution, the theory of scientific revolution, uh, the, his theory of a uh, paradigm shift. I think he has uh, ref, ref, taken reference to the Kuhn's theory by finding out this best account principle. Uh, Taylor, through his moral genealogy, compares these different philosophical religious thoughts 
extend the debate among them and make judgment about which thought can give us give us a better interpretation of moral predicament and what we can learn from each other through such debates. Thus, I would call Taylor's method as a historical comparative hermeneutical approach. Actually, Taylor has given his a name for his his approach. His, he called it a transition in reasoning. However, I think this this name is not not very clear. I mean. We cannot really grasp what a kind of uh, transition in reasoning is talking about. So I think historical comparative hermeneutical approaches seems to be much better for us to grasp his theory, his approach. And Taylor's historical retrieval has shown that uh, Christian faith can make better sense than atheism in explaining the ineliminable aspiration of transcendence affirmed by both theism and Nietzschean. I think uh, this conclusion can be found I mean, in the source of self. And it's, it is implicitly shown in the secular age. Uh, the concern of universal benevolence emphasized by, first of all, the concern of universal benevolence emphasized by secular humanism was actually inherited from the affirmation of ordinary life stressed by the reformation. It means that secular humanism is actually motivated by the moral sources that cannot be explained in its own term. And that's why in this perspective, uh, in this perspective, uh, he will think that this sum is, can give a better explanation of our moral, moral situation than, than the secular humanism. However, Taylor's notion of fullness a starting point of dialogue is very much controversial. Uh, first of all, uh, atheists criticize Taylor for neglecting those who are religious indifference. And actually this is what uh, I finished in the last presentation. Uh, as what I said in, among Chinese, I can see many people, even though they will worship, uh, they, have, they were involved in certain kind of folk religion, they will worship deities, but in a, in certain sense, you can say they are also religious indifference. They will just they they worship deity just for 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 seeking certain protection or seeking the certain benefit given by this deity, rather than uh, rather than really uh, devoted in their religious teaching. So you can say uh, all these people even even. Though they involve in many different, even though they involve in uh, religious practice, they are still, they are seriously, uh, they are actually uh, not really concerned about religion. And second, there are different kinds of transcendence. Um, other than Christian transcendence, let's say the different scholars suggest that there's a horizon, horizontal transcendence and mundane transcendence. And third, most critically, uh, Taylor's notion of fullness is incompatible with uh, ultimate concern of Buddhism, which stressed the idea of Navina, Suyata, and Anantaman. I think th this is the most critical in my presentation. Uh, I really think that uh, Taylor's uh, notion of fullness is, cannot be compatible with this uh, Buddhist, Buddhist concept. And, and in contrast, uh, the concept of ultimate concern by Paul Tillich is very much welcomed by and very influential to North American and East Asian religious scholars. For Tillich, uh, theology must deal with our ultimate concern, which is objectively, fundamentally, and infinitely relevant to our life, rather than simply satisfying our subjective feelings. Tillich use, uses the method of correlation as a way of uniting the message and cultural situation, which is to correlate the question implied in the culture with the answers implied in the message. The method of correlation means that um, uh, the, the, the culture, we try to anal analyze the culture to raise the question about our existential uh, problem. And then, try, and then we try to find the answer from from the religious message. So Tillich of method, Tillich's method of uh, correlation argues that philosophy deals with the structure of being in itself. Theology deals with the meaning of being for us. Thus a philosophical analysis of 
the reality can formulate question about being. That theology answers is based on divine revelation. However, while Tillich allows other religious experiences as independent source, sources for the formation of theology, he only considers non-Christian religions as a kind of cultural expression. It means that one can formulate the existential, existential questions implied in these religious cultural expressions, which the Christian message is supposed to answer. For Tillich, Theologians must work within the theologic, theological circle. If a theologian is open to other original revelations, she has already left the theological circle because she has left the revelatory situation and looks at it in a detached way. However, Dirk Tracy, by examining Tillich's own writing, argues that Tillich's actual use of the method of creation is more dialectic and pluralistic and presents a picture closer to Tillich's authentic position than the method written in his systematic theology. Tillich's writings shows that he even allows the answer, not only the question of psychoanalysis, social, socialist theory, existentialism, and his own self-transcending naturalism to shape his theology. This more puristic dialectic method is also more in line with the hermetical character of much contemporary theology. Thus, I would call Tillich's actual method as the method of dialectic, dialectical correlation, correlation. In Christianity and the Encounter of the World Religions, Tillich argues for four presuppositions as the foundation for interreligious dialogue. First, mutual, mutual recognition of the value of religious experience. And second, serious religious conviction of each representatives, re representatives. Tillich would, would say that uh, if one is not seriously devoted in one's religious uh, one's religion, then one cannot truly be representative representative for uh, of that of that religion to say something about that religion. And third is the common ground for dialogue, and the fourth is openness to critic criticism. While the first, second, and fourth show Tillich's ethical attitude for interreligious dialogue. His common ground for dialogue is using the concept of ultimate concern. In contrast to Tillich's notion of fullness, Tillich's concept of ultimate concern was widely appreciated in religious studies, both in America and in Asia. As Smith states, Tillich's understanding of religion as an ultimate concern provides a language deemed suitable to the new Department of Religious Studies in the country's higher education institution. Lai also points out some Chinese scholars affirm the importance of this concept for the discussion related to religion and even make use of this concept to interpret Confucianism or Buddhism. I think Tillich's concept has two contributions to interreligious dialogue. First, Tillich's concept of ultimate concern refers not only to what concerns us subjectively, it also asks whether the object of concern is truly ultimate, determining our being or non-being. And thus, it can pose a challenge to those of reductive materialism or religious indifference that whether what concerns them seriously without the aspect of transcendence is truly ultimate, in particular in the face of this ever-changing world in which everything won't last forever. I would not expect that this would persuade those materialists and secularists to accept the significance of transcendence. However, this can at least stimulate and bring up a substantive meaningful debate or dialogue among religious and non-religious persons. Second, the popular, the second contribution is that the popular acceptance of uh, Tillich's concept of um, ultimate concern among religious, cultural, and philosophical theories seems to show that it has captured the crucial nature of religious philosophical exploration. Tillich's concept has offered a common point for dialogue among different religions by which an, interpre an interpretative dialogue framework can be formulated. For instance, in Confucian Christian dialogue, Run is uh, obviously Confucius' ultimate concern, which can be dialogue with Christian idea of sanctification. In Buddhist Christian dialogue, Buddhist ultimate concern are liberation, suffering, emptiness, which can dialogue with Christian idea of sin, suffering, liberation, and reconciliation and kingdom of God. With Tillich's method of dialectical correlation, it's not only that Confucianism and Buddhism should pose questions, question about liberation from suffering and becoming run. At that, Christianity answers, but also that Christianity should pose questions such as questions about sins of sin and salvation, eternal life and communion with the creator, that Confucianism, Confucianism and Buddhism answers. We should not only consider Christian message, but also message from Confucianism and Buddhism in shaping our religious thought. The question then follows 
after comparing these different religious answers to our existential problems. How can we arbitrate the difference between these different religious messages? Religious comparison can help find out the similarities and difference between different religious thoughts. This can enhance our mutual understanding. It also helps us obtain a better understanding of our own religion, religious tradition. However, I just want to find something more by doing religious dialogue. And TLIC would assess other religious message based on Christian belief and reject those that deny Christian fundamental assertion that Jesus is Christ. I think certainly there's nothing wrong. I mean, Portilic is a theologian. He certainly should stand, uh, should stand uh, at the at the Christian uh, should take a Christian perspective to build this. But but uh, this Christian centric approach would hardly be accepted by other religious persons. I would argue that Taylor's historical historical comparative hermetical approach may offer a more but a religious perspective on to arbitrate these religious messages. We may start with Tillich's method of dialectical correlation and come up with several issues as a matter of ultimate concern, such as uh, liberation from suffering, more cultivation, sin and salvation, etc., with answering messages from different regions. And then we can arbitrate these different religious messages by Tillich's histor historical comparative hermetical approach and examine which region can make better sense of, of our moral spiritual predicament according to best account principle. It's likely that people with different religion, religious life experience will religious life experience will come up with different conclusions even after such substantive comparative studies. However, such arbitration and erasure of different issues between different religions can help us to have a deeper mutual understanding and push us to have a deeper reflection on one's own religious tradition. Apart from comparative studies, historical accuracy is also important for achieving an in-depth religious dialogue. Taylor insists that it's insufficient to simply finding out certain commonalities or simply achieving certain overlapping consensus on certain moral values, rights, and ideas throughout the intercultural dialogue. Attempts of deeper mutual learning and substantive articulation of values and ideas must follow in order to achieve a fusion of horizons. The aim of dialogue is not only to achieve a kind of sympathetic mutual comprehension, to make the moral spiritual universe of the other seemingly, seemingly less strange, but also to make judgment between different moral spiritual outlooks to learn from each other and hopefully to create a new high -by form of moral spiritual framework. And that's the end of my presentation. Welcome to if any wonderful. question. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Hong, thank you. I find it interesting, uh, as always, you know, Tillich is somebody who wants to concentrate so much on ultimate concerns, ultimate mm. concerns. And mm. you list certain things like uh, the concern for uh, virtue, uh, for uh, um, more existential type of concerns, right? Liberation from suffering. Correct. Yeah, suffering. Um, these the moral cultivation. Right. What's interesting, though, is in a lot of the religious circles that I am familiar with, they would say that those are not ultimate concerns, that those are not uh, area that the ultimate concern is Jesus Christ and salvation in him. Mm -hmm. yes. What would Tillich say to something like that? He like certainly agrees since, <laughs> since he's Christian theologian. Uh, but he knows that uh, different regions will have different ultimate concerns. Since he has uh, experience with to that, he, he has uh, visited Japan, I mean, in the later part of his life. And he did learn something about, uh, have a conversation with uh, Buddhism and know something about uh, Asian regions. So, so he knows different regions will have different kind of, uh, ultimate concern uh, and so that's the it can be a starting point I mean, even though I mean Christians ultimate concern is different from Buddhism however Buddhism's ultimate concern can also uh, let's say how to liberate from suffering I mean, this you can also to, to be dialogue with Christian you can also find something about suffering in Christian message so I think this is the contact point right uh, yeah okay 
is that the essence basically of Tillich's in a religious dialogue? Uh, the paradigm that he has is find the common ground between what both religions uh, think is of, of at least some concern. Maybe it isn't always the ultimate concern always, but mm -hmm. things like suffering or morality or helping the poor. Mm -hmm. Is he suggesting that religions connect on that level then? And that's how you dialogue? Yes, yes I think so, yeah. But since he has write, write, written something about uh, Buddhism and Christian dialogue, uh, and he will he actually focus on this these issues. Certainly some some critics will find that uh Tilek's understanding of Buddhism is not not accurate, but but it doesn't matter. It, it mean uh, that the way is the method is this. I mean they will try to find some Mm. Some issue, I mean, common ground, and and for Buddhism, I mean, Navina or 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 liberation from suffering or 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 selfless is okay. Uh, ultimate concern. Actually, even Buddhism, then there's different different school of Buddhism. <laughs> so different schools has of Buddhism has different ultimate concern. <laughs> so that is just a contact point to to start the dialogue. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um. Is that reductionistic to basically say, in order for us to have a dialogue between religions, we need to find at the base level what we're all what we all agree we're concerned about, and go from it's there. Reductionist. Now, it's a good question. I didn't think about this. Uh, For me, I don't think it's a reduction. Since I, since you know, uh, Tilix, uh, really experience of that uh, interreligious dialogue is not much. I mean, I mean, he has not much, ex uh, not much chance to have such substantive dialogue. But I, I think it's, it's a uh, afterward. I mean, you know, afterward he studies. I, I can see different, let's say, Confucianism and Buddhism. They really uh, endorse this concept. I mean, to to keep to keep dialogue with Christianity. So I. And I can see they will, they will not just stop on those issues. They will also find out what's the difference between, let's say, Confucian, Confucian, Confucianism and Christian. Uh, so, so I think, um, I don't think it's a kind of reductionism, but, um, but I think it just gives us a starting point to, mm. to, to open the dialogue. Yeah. To, to expand, to expand it later. Yeah. So start with what you have in common. Yes. And build yes. from there. And then, and when you've established the dialogue, when you've established the trust and the rapport, then you can go into the nuances of the differences and maybe the struggles between the religions. Yes, I think yeah, it's, I, I I can see is is the way the Confucian and Christian dialogue, uh, uh, operate in this way. I mean, they 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 uh, Confucians will for Confucians they will constep out. You know how to become a run uh, a more about of uh, uh, moral cultivation uh, to be to be virtuous person perfect virtuous person and and they they will start from here to dialogue with Christianity and then they will also talk about transcendent actually Confucianism uh in before don't don't con are not concerned so much about the transcendent but in face of the Christianity they talk so much about transcendent they will have to reply this charge and they will also talk about transcendent even though it's a kind of imminent transcendent for confucianism so so i think so i think it's not a reduction it's just a starting point and then it, it may expand expand through dialogue and since let's say something something uh, you can find in christianity and you cannot find in confucianism it, it it really brings a challenge for them to think about this perspective interesting okay is there are there areas where Focusing on ultimate concern will actually create division and antagonism between the religions. I think of, uh, let's say, for whatever reason, we're in dialogue with ISIS, um, with members of ISIS. And for them, ultimate concern is, is not only following the will of Allah, but also imposing it. Uh, very strictly in their region of control. That to them might be an ultimate concern. Whereas 
uh, the being liberated from suffering may not actually be part of their ultimate concern. So would focusing on ultimate concerns ever be a hindrance and actually create the division? I, I don't think it's, a, it's such a antagonistic, I mean, such a hostility between different regions is not because of their uh, ultimate concern, or rather it's because of how they view the other religions. I mean, how, how they view themselves in the history and how, how they see the other religions. Let's say, I mean, honestly, actually, um, Christian, Christian belief is also quite absolute, you know, for, 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 for Christian. I mean, Christian doctrine, I mean, Trinity or salvation or all this for them is also absolute. I mean, but but I don't think, I mean, at least in, in, in Chinese community, I mean, a Christian, they, they, let's say me, I'm a Christian in Chinese community. I mean, I'm in an environment you know, of a, a multicultural uh, environment. And actually I, I was brought up in a quite Chinese, traditional Chinese, environment so i can understand i mean those who are not christian they they don't they don't they don't know all this and they cannot understand at least at this moment so so i think i think such a hostility between uh, different regions is not it's not whether it's ultimate concern or not about i mean the region rather it's their attitude i mean towards towards the differences oh interesting so, okay yeah i i i Actually, I don't. I don't know. I have never. I, I don't know much about ISIS. Actually, I don't know whether ISIS will use ultimate concern as, as their wording. I mean, <laughs> sure. Um, no, that is a. It's an interesting point that you you're arguing basically that um, there is a chance that there is still common ground and that it wouldn't be ul the ultimate concerns that creates the division but rather the attitude and approach to the dialogue in the first place. That's what would end up creating the division. Yeah, yes, you can say so. Um, actually, even let's say Tilek brings out ultimate concern here, or always, uh, he already acknowledged that different regions has different ultimate concerns. So whether you, I think the point is whether you acknowledge the different regions can, can be, their, their concern ultimately is different. <laughs> So uh, your ultimate concern does not mean is everyone's is the same. I mean, I just think I I I I I don't I don't think it is related to to those uh terrorists or 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 hostility between between different okay. regions. Well, I'm curious as a Talikian scholar, um, do you find that there's anything in there that um, and I guess this will go for Char Charles Taylor as well. Mm -hmm. Do you find, what is your biggest criticism? Where do you think that there is a big weakness in either Charles Taylor or Paul Tillich or both? Uh, Charles Taylor, uh, the, the weakness is already mentioned in the presentation. I think his notion of fullness is really controversial. It's actually inherited from, from Aristotle's eudaimonic ethics. And even honestly, even let's say in Protestant, you know, uh, there's a uh, divine command theory. They may not also, they may, they may not consider the notion of fullness uh, as the fundamental, fund fundamental of the ethics, you know. So it's, it's really Aristot Aristotelian and it, it cannot, it, it may not work in other regions. Oh, interesting. And, and for, for Thiele, um, I think Tillich is uh his he endorses a historical approach and I, I really appreciate his uh, method of correlation, but I just think uh Charles Taylor uh I think he has he has learned many things from hermeneutics and 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 hermeneutics uh is not not that well developed in Tillich's time. So I think uh, Taylor's hermeneutical approach, uh in particular his uh uh that's a common principle. I mean, it really gives us certain criteria for us to judge, you know, to judge different religious messages. And mm -hmm. this, this is what I cannot find in Tillich. Uh, as what I said, Tillich's approach is still based on, his judgment uh, seems that still based on uh, certain uh, fundamental theo theological principles or messages. Uh, and I think as a theologian, it's, it's right, but 
but probably Tillich, uh, uh, Taylor is a philosopher, so he will he will not he has to be dialogued with different philosopher, non-religious and religious and different traditions. So so he will he will know that uh, that the judgment should cannot be if in order for us to have dialogue with different different traditions, we cannot judge others by 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 using the Christian perspective. Mm. Well, it is, that's actually a concern. You kind of touched on it uh, a little bit of one of my concerns with both that, in fact, is that both Charles Taylor and Paul Tillich seem to approach interreligious dialogue philosophically as opposed to something more pragmatically, something more practical. Uh, and, that, and so I often wonder, is their methodology a little high end? a little too, you know, cerebral, a little too cognitive and philosophical. Based. You mean unpractical? Correct. But, uh, but, well, but, maybe not, maybe not unpractical, but a bit out of reach for the common religion. Common people. Right? Oh yeah. You can say it's really for the scholars. <laughs> it's not, it's not for, 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 for the lay person. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's really uh, for, for scholars. Yeah. And, and that and that would be my probably my biggest uh, concern is that it, it's it's a great philosophical foundation, a great uh, cognitive and, and intellectual dive into the notion of interreligious dialogue. But on the ground level, does it help Muslims and Jews and Christians and Buddhists work together for a common good, if you will? It but allows I, mm -hmm, scholars yeah. to interact with each other, mm -hmm. but does it allow the common layperson to interact mm -hmm. with each other? I just think uh, usually the those uh, you know the the culture or those um, the thought the think th this kind of thinking I mean usually uh, is diffused from from the scholar I mean to the layperson right. Let's say uh, my I'm I'm a Protestant or Christian. Um, in in a traditional Protestant Christian, usually we will think Catholic is wrong, you know. But but uh, later on, I mean, it's, it usually starts with the scholars. I mean, hmm. they 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 are at open attitude towards Catholic. It will also also influence me, and they will bring up certain certain points. I mean, let us understand. I mean, I I, I think uh, it's not it's not uh either or. I think the scholar even though what they provide is uh, for scholar, but it can help I mean, to popularize all these hmm. different You're religious, saying uh, it'll trickle down eventually. Yeah, trickle down, that's right, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, and there is evidence that um, belief systems do change, uh, do change after the seminary and the university has kind of brought in new stuff. The problem is that the trickle down effect doesn't happen for a generation or so. It can take decades of dialogue in oh. between the scholars for it to reach down to the common person. Um, yes, and that's, because of, and that's because of the middle level. Oftentimes the scholars will be talking about it up here, which then finally gets filtered down to the pastors and the preachers, the imams and the rabbis. Mm and the monks and the priests and, and also, they disseminate it but it takes and, time yes on the one hand it takes time i on the other hand, i also think it really depends on on where i mean which in which city you know if mm. let's say you know in hong kong it's very international then it seems we we used to be stimulated by very different different uh, viewpoint so in many uh, many chinese i mean uh, christian chinese of uh, theologian. I mean, they have been in the U.S. or in Canada. They will say that uh, it seems that the in 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 Hong Kong mainly the Christian are evangelicals. They will feel that uh, the evangelicals in Hong Kong is much open mm. than those in Canada and America. So I just think uh, probably in in the U.S. Let's say if you are in a place not not as New York or or the the big city, you know, or or or. or or what I, I'm not very familiar with the city. Uh, I have been where? Or uh, Chicago or all mm -hmm. this, you know, well, one city, then maybe let's say I 
in the, in the past, I've heard a few Christians saying that uh, they're, they're well, I mean, that where they live are all are traditional Christians. So they, they didn't get in touch with other religious or whatever. So they, they don't have such stimulation. They don't so they'll take it for granted. To diversity. Yeah, they have no such, uh, yeah, they have no such exposure. So they will mm. take, take, take what they used to believe for granted. And so I think the situation also, also affect the, their attitude towards other religious religion. Yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, we do know just from sociological and psychological studies that the more exposure people have to divergent belief systems uh, in their environment, the more diverse their environment is, the more open mm -hmm. they are to dialogue, uh, to empathy. Uh, the more isolated a group is, mm -hmm. the more homogenous that group is, the less tolerant they become. So you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. Uh, and it is interesting to think about on the ground level, is it mm -hmm. possible for the higher end philosophical stuff to reach them quicker because they're in a more diverse area, which means they might end up having more exposure to the higher end philosophical stuff. You know, probably the internet will help. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. <exactly. laughs> think really probably internet will help. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Dr. Yeah. Hung, thank you so much for this presentation. It was wonderful. Okay. Again. Thank you. Um, and and uh, really enlightening. I, I'm a big fan of both Charles Taylor and Paul Tillich, so it's always fun listening to their different approaches um, to different different aspects. So thank you so much again. And I do want to say to everybody in attendance, thank you for attending, coming out and supporting us. Uh, we do have a full day of presentation, so I hope I'll see you at some of the other lectures. And Dr. Hung, I'll give you the last word, sir. Oh. Uh, thanks everyone for listening to my presentation. Uh, I'm still writing my paper. If you have any comments, welcome to send me the send me your opinions and comments or criticism. Thank you. Bye bye.